So when we talk about the history of science fiction, there are certain things that come up. And one of the things that often gets discussed nowadays is the unfortunate fact, perhaps, that historically a lot of the roots of this genre have been mired in this imperialistic context of the desire to expand and conquer other lands and so on. That could be the ocean, the air, but especially, of course, space, which we'll see plenty of later. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's not 100% always an unfortunate thing. It is true that without this desire to build and engineer things and expand, many of humanity's scientific advances would simply not happen. We're in a position of sort of an awkward place we're in, but it is an interesting one because we are about to discuss an author who, for better or worse, his name sort of became synonymous with English imperialism. Right. This is Roger Kipling. Now, our author tonight is unusual because he is very well known nowadays still. People know his name and they often quote him without even realizing that that's the person that they're quoting. Yeah. His influence has really gone far and wide. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1907. And his most famous works, I would say nowadays, are probably The Jungle Book and Kim. And both those books deal with life in what Kipling's readers would probably largely have considered an alien place. Kipling himself, Joseph Rudyard Kipling, was born in 1865 in the wintertime in Bombay, now Mumbai. And when he was five, he and his younger sister were sent off to live in England. And it seems like this was something that so-called Anglo-Indians often did. And it's just part of the I would say of all the writers that we've done so far on the podcast, Kipling's probably got one of the weirdest backgrounds and histories. And maybe this contributed a little bit to his persona, but... I would imagine so, yeah. Ah, of course. So he was uh, uh, this was common among the British upper class in India at the time, was that they would send their little kids off to England to be in their horrible Dickensian boarding schools and stuff because they thought that the kids just didn't have enough English mannerism to be brought up properly because they were in a foreign land. It made sense. So some of these kids didn't have any relatives. They were just sent off to live with total strangers who were paid to board them. So this is essentially what happened to Rudyard Kipling. Uh, he was sent off to live with this family called the Holloways, in Portsmouth. They did have one aunt who lived in England, but it seems like the rest of the family were all living abroad. And his father was the principal of an art college in India. And the idea I think that they had for Rudyard was that he would be smart enough and good enough to gain entry into Oxford, but there was no such luck for him. And so his father, who didn't really have a lot of money, but seemed to be fairly well connected in what was then British India, had him get a job in Lahore. He was about 17 years old at this time. And the job that Rajard had been given by his father was essentially to run the newspaper, which is this sort of combination military slash literary gazette. Seems like a very strange hodgepodge of things were published in this newspaper. And he was the assistant editor, so his job was just basically to make sure everything was okay with the paper. But he very quickly was writing content for the newspaper. And at this time, his first collection of verse was published. And it was called Departmental Ditties. And no doubt it was inspired by his new work experience. And this was in 1886. Now... Kipling at this time, he was a very young man, obviously, and he seemed to have this feverish need to write. So because he was encouraged to write stories for the Gazette, and he, he wrote dozens of them between 1886 and 1887. There's a really incredible amount of short story output. And as a result of this, by 1888, 
he'd already published six short story compilations. It seems kind of unprecedented, and I think the fact that he had his books published in India first, perhaps he just had the family connections, and it wasn't the same as being published in England for the first time. I mean, I think that a lot of the stories got highly praised, and they were probably good. I haven't read too many of them. I have read a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I haven't either, actually. This is the yeah, first I've read from him. I've seen the Disney version of The Jungle Book when I was a kid, okay. but I actually haven't read the novel. So I read The Jungle Book when I was much younger, and I also read Kim. And I don't remember Kim very well, but it's a book that I would like to read again, mm -hmm. because I think that I didn't quite grasp everything at that time. But, I mean, it's a really interesting book, and it seems autobiographical in the sense that it's essentially about a boy who's an orphan, but he's in India, and he's a British by blood, I suppose, but he's right. living the life of an urchin on the streets in India and traveling around the country, and he meets up with this, well, Kipling calls him a llama, I think, and he's like sort of wise elder kind of person who teaches Kimbo the ways of the world, and they go on all these adventures together, and I mean, I may as well say this now, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, but I mean, Kipling was seen at his time even, and now especially, as a real reactionary symbol of the British Raj, of imperialism. I mean, he wrote the poem, The White Man's Burden, yeah. and that's where that phrase comes from. And it's impossible to avoid these things about Kipling when you talk about him, and right. I think that and even people at the time they did. were like, hey, man, yeah. you know? <laughs> Mark Twain cut into him pretty hard for that, because it's a pretty bad take, <laughs> especially yeah. in light of the Spanish-American War, which was brutal towards the Philippines. I mean, mm. it was just a nasty, nasty piece of business, and I, I think Twain was pretty right to dig at that. Yeah, I mean, it is distasteful, but I also think that perhaps, perhaps his views were a little bit more nuanced than what was assumed yeah and i think he grew as a person as he aged the issues dealing with empire and expansion in the two stories we are reading tonight the first from 1905 and the second from 1912 are considerably later and they really present a more nuanced view even if that view tends to be rather grotesque and exaggerated in some ways, as we'll yeah. see when we get into the material. So I think Kipling wrote a lot of poetry, like thousands of poems. Yeah. And he was in many ways quite renowned for his poetry, but he was also accused, and, and rightfully so, because apparently he did get paid to do this, but especially during the First World War, he was writing very pro-British propaganda pieces. And again, like the poetry is a source of, of much of the controversy, too. We get the poem White Man's Burden, we also get this poem called Recessional. Now, I'm not going to read any of these poems. I'm going to read a poem a little bit later because I think it ties in sort of to leading into the genre that we talk about on the podcast. But in these poems, he would talk about empire and he would talk about it with much glory, but he would also temper it a little bit. And he didn't always make it sound, even early on, particularly jingoistic, like the poem for Queen Victoria's Jubilee was recessional, and he had written that for that purpose, but it was almost more like, rather than here are the glories of Rome, it was like, here are the glories of Rome, but like Rome, they won't necessarily last. Right. So, I mean, he wasn't like completely blindsided. I think he was just in favor of the status quo in a certain sense. And I think also being brought up in India in that upper class at least in the beginning, and, oh, then, absolutely. The, and then returning yeah. there as a teen, yeah. led him to believe in certain things that may not have been true. And he tried to observe sympathetically the world around him. But I think that, yeah, often that class thing probably blinded him. Now, as well as White Man's Burden, there is the poem East is East. And that's a pretty famous one just because of one line that often gets repeated. And it's often something that gets repeated to show what kind of person people think that Kipling was. And it is, East is East and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. And that's what it says, but uh, that's only the beginning of the stanza. There's more to that, and the poem actually goes on to say, But there is neither East nor West, border nor breed, nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face. 
though they come from the ends of the earth. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like he believes in the brotherhood of man to a certain extent. I think he just kind of feels that it's because he's so pro-British and he's so like, he's a little bit patriotic. So he's like, we have to, to help these people. And it's a little condescending to be sure. Uh, yeah, a little. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. you know, when he thinks that once man faces man, where they're born and stuff like that doesn't matter all that much. And yeah, I mean, he, he served certain political causes and I think that his politics could get a little bit infuriating. He was certainly a conservative in England. And although his wife was an American, his wife was from, her family was from Vermont and they married and lived there for several years. They actually left America and Kipling sort of had a falling out with Americans, although I think he always kind of admired them. But he had a falling out over that damn Monroe Doctrine again. He thought that this was a problem, and he actually wrote a uh, article in a Canadian newspaper, I think it was the Montreal Gazette or something, where he was sort of decrying the American influence and how talking about how Canada should resist it and stuff. And it's like, okay, that's all well and good, but if you weren't a representative of Her Majesty the Queen, like, I don't know, I don't know, it just, it's... Yeah, it's a little bit, oh, I don't, <laughs> yeah, it's condescending. It's a little bit like full of itself, maybe, I guess, yeah. in uh, that way. But here's the thing. Kipling is a really, really good writer. And I don't want us to separate the art from the artist. I don't really believe in that phrase. But at the same time, because somebody had some, some views that were perhaps reprehensible, there's more to the man than that. Right. And I, I don't think these stories are really an expression of those ideas. Like, even though Empire does play a part in both of these stories, it's yeah, not... There's definitely some weird politics in the second story. Yeah. But we'll get to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah, it, it's just not portrayed in the kind of flag-waving, jingoistic thing that even Griffith is doing. No. It's much more interesting than Griffith. You feel like Kipling has really thought a lot of things through. And here's the thing about Kipling, too, or one of the things. He traveled a lot all throughout his young life, pretty much until his family settled finally in Britain in 1904, I believe, and pretty much stayed there till he died in 1936. But all before that time, he was traveling. He went to America. He spent a lot of time there. Obviously, he lived there for a while, but even before that, he was traveling around the United States writing articles for the Gazette that he was still working for at the time in India. And he went to Japan. He apparently was very impressed with Japanese culture. And perhaps, I don't know, it was meaningless. Perhaps it was a boast. You know, he wrote this thing about how he fell in, how he fell in love with this Japanese girl and stuff like that. A, a tourist of the world, and I suppose... Many British colonials would have followed a similar path. Yeah, probably. Yes, they were part of this class. But you can't deny, I suppose, that a lot of them maybe did feel like they were sort of homeless. You know, like they didn't really have a country the way other people did. But now it seems like Kipling sort of forgot about this pretty quickly because he's such a standard bearer for the empire in England and so on. But that... I guess did kind of seem to come later, you know, when he was questioning America's position and he decided that he needed to leave there. He was writing during a lot of his time when he lived in Vermont is actually when he wrote The Jungle Book. And he really enjoyed writing of this book and got a lot of correspondence from children and stuff. And I think that this was something that carried on through a lot of his career is he often wrote stories for children. And they are unusual stories. They're not run-of-the-mill sort of stuff. A lot of them sort of paint interesting, strange portrayals of English history. There's the, the just-so stories, which are very strange. And there's stuff like Stalking and Company, which sort of details his school experiences, but like in a fictionalized way. And contrary to this idea of Kipling as being this reactionary, stodgy status quo kind of person, those stories are very irreverent and they're very like brash and the 
kids in these stories are not like they cause a lot of problems and they're not necessarily punished for it <laughs> right so right uh, i don't know i mean it's a complex figure definitely now we are a science fiction podcast so we should probably talk about how kipling might have influenced science fiction well i think that seems like a sort of a complicated question i mean as someone who traveled the world a lot and somebody who thought obviously a great deal about social issues whatever side of the fence he was actually on he actually thought i think a lot about the future and speculated about what things might develop and he was yeah. interested in science he was interested in engineering and he was very much of the spirit and one of his most famous poems is called if and it is a poem that is highly i guess read and regarded in the English school system was for a long time, and I think maybe it is even the reason Lindsay Anderson named his movie If, which is a movie about a very tyrannical British boarding school and how the boys in the school are treated until they find a secret cache of weapons hmm. left over from World War II and decide to go to town on their teachers and everybody else. And this is the one. movie that made Malcolm McDowell famous and made... Stanley Kubrick want to cast him in A Clockwork Orange. Ah, huh, interesting. So, and the poem, if, is essentially, in one sense, it can be interpreted as this sort of peon to stiff upper lip British mentality. And in essence, I mean, you can go read the poem. Maybe we can link it on the website. There's, a, there's actually a cool reading on YouTube of the actor Ralph Fiennes reading the poem, if. And it's essentially saying, well, all these adversities that you face... If you can look them in the eye and not stand down and still be strong, then you'll be a man. And, I mean, it's kind of sentimental a little bit. I don't know. Like, I think that even the poem that we're going to mention in the last story that we're reading tonight, it was a more evocative poem to me than this really famous poem that Kipling wrote. Yeah. But, in essence, you know, it gets to the heart of something that Kipling really believed in. He believed in... He seemed to really believe in hard work. He believed in people having respect for the things that they built and the institutions that they built and the machines that they built. So in 1935, there was a professor at the University of Toronto uh, Engineering School, and he asked, he wrote Kipling a letter, and he asked him if he could come up with some kind of written sort of ceremony or, or something for engineers. And I don't really know all the details of how this happened, but Kipling agreed to do it. And he wrote this poem, and the poem is called A Hymn to Breaking Strain. And during this ceremony, which is carried on here in some Canadian universities, and I don't know about elsewhere, but maybe, which is called The Ritual to the Calling of the Engineers. And... This poem is read aloud, and the ritual itself is private, so I don't really know what goes on in it. I mean, I'm sure it's not thing, nothing that crazy, but you have to also remember, this kind of thing seemed to speak to Kipling's heart, because he was a Freemason, and this sort of, like, society of technocratic individuals is something that shows through in the stories that we're going to read, especially the first one. Right. And I think this was of great interest to him. So because I think it ties in directly to our genre, and because writers in the science fiction genre like Robert A. Heinlein and Poole Anderson have talked about Kipling and how much he is an influence on them, and because John Brunner, all too underrated British science fiction writer from the 1960s and 70s, edited an anthology of stories dedicated to Roger Kipling. I think it might be relevant to read this poem. So I'm going to read this poem now, and then we're going to get into discussing the first of two stories that Roger Kipling wrote that I think are definitely beautiful examples of very modern science fiction. Oh, absolutely. The careful textbooks measure, let all who build beware. The load, the shock, the pressure material can bear. So when the buckled girder lets down the grinding span, the blame of loss or murder is laid upon the man. 
not on the stuff, the man, but in our daily dealing with stone and steel, we find the gods have no such feeling of justice toward mankind. To know, said Gage, they make us, for no laid course prepare, and presently overtake us with loads we cannot bear, too merciless to bear. The prudent textbooks give it in tables at the end, the stress that shears a rivet or makes a tie bar bend. What traffic wrecks macadam, what concrete should endure, but we poor sons of Adam have no such literature to warn us or make sure we hold all earth to plunder, all time and space as well, to wonder stale, to wonder at each new miracle, till in the mid-illusion of Godhead, neath our hand, falls multiple confusion on all we did or planned, the mighty works we planned. We only of creation, O luckier bridge and rail, abide the twin damnation, to fail and know we fail. Yet we, by which sole token, we know we once were gods, take shame in being broken however great the odds, the burden of the odds, O veiled and secret power, whose paths we seek in vain, be with us in our hour of overthrow and pain, that we, by which sure token, we know thy ways are true, in spite of being broken, because of being broken, may rise and build anew, stand up and build anew. So now, we're going to take you to the year 2000, and we're going to talk about a new society that has been built on the basis of easy, relatively easy, but perhaps still rather dangerous, aerial travel. With the Night Mail is not a story that we are going to treat like other stories we do in the podcast, because I think there's not too much point in summarizing this story. Yeah, plot-wise, there's probably as much here as Tornadres that we did from episode 15, where this story is all style, and not much really happens plot-wise. And what right. happens plot-wise is pretty cool, but that's not the point of the story at all. Yeah, it's not just style though; it's world building, and yeah, we have exactly. not seen we haven't seen this kind of world building since Star Sai, and very uncommonly in general. Yeah, I gotta say, I read this story three times. It's the first time for the podcast that I have done that, and each time I read the story, I kind of stopped making standard summary notes for it because it was just like. <laughs> There are events that happen in this story, but really what this story is, is it is a person, unnamed, probably a journalist. Yeah, definitely a journalist. He, yeah. he writes for the same publication, yeah. Right, and it's an actual, so this wasn't in all the versions. This story was published in 1904, originally, and it was in three different magazines. And I think it was the Windsor Magazine. I might yeah. have to check on this. And I think it was the Windsor Magazine that actually framed this as a story written in the Windsor Magazine in the year 2000. Yeah, the edition on Forgotten Futures has a lot of really good commentary on the differences between the text because they are minor but somewhat significant. And some of the book reproductions don't contain 
some little bits of text uh, yeah. here and there. So there's bonus material. Yeah. This story has bonus material. The bonus material was not published in the first edition in 1904. I believe it came in with the Actions and Reactions edition. So that would have been the first book published edition. Yeah. But the supplemental material or bonus material is really cool. Oh, it's so cool. It's <laughs> just as good as the story itself. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. We have this journalist who is his his job, I guess, or his assignment for the day is that he has to travel with mail carrier 162, which is an ABC or Aerial Board of Control mail ship en route from London, England to Quebec. And it's carrying people's mail. So it's a very important job. There's a lot of what a modern audience would call world building, like right from the start. And it's actually quite overwhelming. And we haven't really seen anything like this on the podcast yet. This really made me think of, I mean, this came up, I think we both sort of thought of it independently, but it, it made me think of something like Dune, where yeah. it just throws you into the deep end and expects you to just kind of catch up. Yeah, I was thinking Dune for a slightly different reason in that it kind of foresees a transportation guild controlling, like, everything. That's true. But... The way it throws you into everything and really uses a lot of language that the reader is going to be unfamiliar with, but assumes that you know what you're talking about, feels very modernist in a way. It goes beyond Star Psy, certainly, where at least with Star Psy, we get this whole like introductory explanation of how we have come into these documents. Yeah. But this feels like we're there on the ship with the yeah. narrator. And what's more, it feels like it's the thing that's developed is a natural development of exactly. where things were at yeah. the time the story was written. And it's like, let's project this 100 years forward. Let's talk about a group of aeronauts that they're not all male people. They're all aeronauts and they have their own culture. They have their own language or at least jargon. Yeah. They have their own techno babble. They have their own codes of honor and conduct, and they're flying through the air doing all these things for all the little people down below and carrying them around, so they run everything. <laughs> it's, it's kind of that simple. They have a slang, they have a way of life, and they're free, more or less, although they all kind of work for this aerial control board, which is sort of half elected and half nominated, they say. And they certainly have a lot of sway in the world. Yeah. So our narrator meets the captains, Purnell and Hodgson. One of them is like this outgoing captain and another one is the incoming captain. I guess they just sort of hang out on the ship until one of them can disembark somewhere. The incoming captain's this big guy. He's like sort of brash and loud, but very friendly. And the journalist seems to be having a reasonably good time with these people. One thing I noticed, the story is in first-person present, and I normally really hate that, but I guess for journalism, it kind of works, and right. I guess it's funny because it does seem to change like partway through, and it seems like as he becomes more familiar with things, and maybe things happen where like, like they encounter a lot of bad weather on the trip, and it may be difficult to write sometimes, so I guess like it sort of eventually just sort of goes back into past tense which yeah. is what you would expect. But I didn't notice, like, the whole first half is in first-person present until, like, the th after I had read it already. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I normally don't like that. But I didn't even notice here, right? It's fine. It's like, it works. It feels like a natural journalistic piece, but from the future. Yeah. It's, it's really cool how it comes across. Yeah, I definitely agree. They go over the North Sea, and there's all this stuff about how there's safety and height and they talk about things like the two scientists who are supposedly in tandem sort of responsible for how like common flight became such a thing. There is Fleury and Menyak. <laughs> Menyak is kind of just described as this hopeless person who wanted his inventions to be used for war. And when they decided that that wasn't going to happen, he like 
couldn't take it because he wanted to serve yeah. his country, <laughs> and Kipling is actually kind of lampooning that. Right. So, uh, yeah, like it is an anti-war stance that this guy has. It's not yeah. like, it's, it's a bit more nuanced than just, oh, I want Britain to rule everything, which is seemingly what Griffith was <laughs> Right, saying. it's somebody who had no conception of civilian life or what to do with technology once a war ends. Right, right. Which is really strange and frustrating because it seems counter to what you would think it would be. Like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't right. know. It's, I don't want to talk about Griffith anymore. Let's talk about Kipling. So <laughs> they talk a lot about how being higher is better. And obviously, these aeronauts, like, they're they're real daring do boys. Like, they live pretty dangerously, let's put it that way, if they're on their own. Now, some of them have to run things like passenger liners, and they're maybe a bit less so because they're sort of conscious of the people under their charge. But guys like Captain Hodgson of the mail carrier 162, he don't give a damn about safety and stuff like that. He's going to be like, yeah, I mean, my ship is my ship, and I'm going to make sure that people know that I know how to fly. And so when they get into some bad weather and stuff, he will really, like, there's a point where their airship looks like it might be in trouble. And there's actually a lot of air traffic. Like, that's, that's another thing. Yeah, the lanes are specifically controlled, so certain yeah. ships can only fly on certain lanes, and if you're in a postal lane and you're not qualified to be there, which does happen, they stumble upon this, like, junk yeah. fighter. Yeah, there's this hilarious discussion between the two captains of the, like, the struggling ship that's in the wrong lane, and Captain Hodgson, and they're, like, yelling insults at each other. Yeah. It's so well done, and so, like funny i mean it's it's everything that griffith wasn't like exactly there's yeah. actual dialogue here there's actual yeah. people saying cool things to each other that are fun right and yeah. that means something so yeah there's also a communication system that seems to be like this almost like broad like citizens band radio kind of thing where like yeah. everybody sort of listens in and you can sort of make public calls on the radio system and sort of ask for assistance or tell people when, like, an airship is in trouble. Yeah, wireless was certainly further along at this time. One of the things of the techno babble is he talks about a vacuum chamber that contains U-tubes. And yeah. the vacuum tube was invented in real life in 1904, so pretty close to when this was written. The exact year. Yeah. So in this vacuum chamber, this is where the flurry rays generated, yeah. I think? Right, exactly. And there's a guy who runs the flurry ray. He sits in a YouTube, which is like YouTube. Right. Right. <laughs> which is a real thing. But it's just it was kind of funny seeing that term, like given now what, what everybody means when they say YouTube. Right. Because I know it's an actual engineering term, right? Like for a tube. If a certain shape. But it just it was just funny to see that. So the and there's a lot of interesting one of the things that seemed just so very modern about this was just the way that the aeronauts had their, they had their culture. And, like, they have things that developed around that culture, like songs about the Ray slaves or the slaves of a Ray. And they're not literal slaves, but their job is just to sit in this tube and, I guess, make sure that the Ray is firing properly because right. nothing can interfere with the ray it has to exist in a vacuum yeah and it's this mystery source of power that nobody knows really how it works even flurry himself didn't know yeah and the slightest thing like disturbance of air or touch of alien particles will disrupt right. the functioning of the ray towards the end there's this really cool song that some of that they're singing about the slave of the ray and how he wants to come back to his loved one and stuff like that and it's just it was just so the story just so puts you in the place where yeah. it wants you to be and it's yeah. so good like it's so good to the level of writing that we don't really see all that much yet in our podcast i mean every now and then we come across something that's really cool like this i mean for the most part a lot of science fiction stuff that would be published in 1904 would be in pulp magazines. Yeah. And it wouldn't necessarily read like this. It would probably read more like a Griffith, typically. Unfortunately, that's probably true. Yeah. Now, I mean, this was magazine published too, but I guess it was... Uh, I don't know. Like, there were some of the British brow. magazines... 
Yeah, I mean, there were some that were churning out stuff that was actually interesting and good, and, and the pulp stuff is too sometimes, but... No, for like, sure, yeah. But, I mean, this is definitely, like, serious literature level. I mean, the bonus stuff that comes in at the end reminded me of more of modernist works, like some parts of Ulysses with the advertisement chapter. But, yeah, no, this would definitely stack up there as far as not just genre fiction, but, like, all literature from the period, I think. Yeah, and there's so much technical stuff in here. Yeah, the techno babble is great. You can tell... Yeah, and then you can tell, you can just sort of picture somebody like Asimov or Heinlein. Yeah, for sure. I feel like these stories were a big influence on Robert Heinlein. I feel like... Especially the second one, yeah. Right, and we'll get to that, but like even this one too, I think just the, the way he describes the culture and the excitement that you can feel in his description of... Yeah. Like even in other senses, like he Heinlein was influenced by Kipling. He said, Citizen of the Galaxy was inspired by Kim. And mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't read that Heinlein book, but I can picture that. I can just really picture him reading this guy and just getting so excited and wanting to tell stories like this. Sure, and yeah, yeah. So there's some really awesome descriptions of Captain Hodgson standing on the bridge of the 162. And there's some good humor in this story too, because the bridge is kind of a euphemism. Like there isn't really a bridge. Like, the ship is actually really crapped, and the bridge is just this little platform that the captain kind of stands on, and if you're, like, coming to the bridge, then you just kind of see the captain's legs sticking out, and it is kind of funny, like, it's, it's kind of a little bit humorous, but there's this really awesome description, nonetheless, of Captain Hodgson standing on this platform, and he's essentially steering the ship, and the ship is flying at 8,000 feet up and not only does he have the steering wheel but he has all these like pedals and stuff and it's almost like an organ the way he describes it like a pipe organ he's got these lift shunt stops which are like the stops of an organ and he's sort of pushing and pulling them and you can hear all these grinding sounds and stuff as the machinery moves and the gears work and it just so wow I mean people don't know Roger Kipling as a sci-fi writer <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so it's all here, man. It's all here. And he wrote some other science fiction stories as well, it seems. But it look, looks like these two, I think, are the most well-known out of any of those. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the others seem... They seem a little bit more tangential, although there is this one alternate history story, The Eye of Allah, which seems interesting. And it was like, it depicts some kind of like special microscope technology being introduced in the 13th century. Yeah. That seems like that might be a really interesting one. And, you know, there's there's another one. There's sort of, it almost seems like the story that became the little engine that could or something, where he's, like, personifying train engines and stuff like that. Right. And, and I feel like these two might be the most modern in style and the way, like, it's the culture that really blows me away. That, yeah, that makes, for sure. I mean, the technical yeah. stuff is great, but the, the whole, there's a new flying culture. And this is what they're like. And that's why this guy is on the airship, because his job is to explain this culture to the general public that might right, not exactly. necessarily know. Yeah. I mean, they might go on passenger liners halfway across the world, but they don't know about the people that run the things. They don't know about the gas bags hanging over their heads. They right. don't know about the flurry ray. They don't know about the dials that measures the height. They don't know about the electric tape that spools out, which is cut from every airship after it reaches its destination and sent directly to the aerial control board, where they use the information about height and air friction and other things that are captured on the tape to train new aeronautical pirates. Sorry, pilots, not pirates. <laughs> uh, hopefully they're not pirates. I don't think the ABC looks kindly on those guys. No, no. But So at the end of the story, they run into a hospital ship, and the sort of crew of the ship is singing a song, and they exchange like pleasantries. And this is kind of a, a fun thing that happens, I guess, when airships pass each other. And the men of a 162 start sort of reminiscing about old times, some of which they never experienced themselves, but they're talking about 
mankind and its treatment of disease and how things like the life expectancy have improved so much in recent years. They talk about things like how people used to, when they had their sick populations in the villages and stuff, they would take them to a high place. And now there's sort of sabbatical airships that hang out at really great heights where people go to receive treatments, medical treatments, where hopefully they can be, their lives can be improved. So they love the heights and they love the air and they love to be at a great height because it's what gives them their special position over the world. And I guess they deserve that position because they're the brave boys of the ABC. So there you have it. That's the story of With the Night Mail. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff in this story and little details too. One neat thing they have on board is this dip dial that is like an onboard flight recorder that records yeah. every single movement the ship makes. Right, um, and that's I was talking about that earlier. And it's like, yeah, and they, they save those tapes and they send them back to the ABC and they use them to study meteorology. And there's this, uh, the Mark boats. Yeah. Don't for, yeah, we can't forget the Mark boats. So the Mark boats are basically these meteorology stations and they're just general like help stations that i guess hang out at various intervals along the airways if there are distress calls and things like that the mark boat is like it's the office it's the the combination bureaucratic office slash way station slash hospital maybe even sometimes like yeah i don't know it's it's an all-purpose thing and it's yeah, like they contact the 162 and they're all solicitous and stuff. And this is when Captain Hodgson is a little bit dismissive. He's like, a, you're a gruff sailor type person. And he doesn't <laughs> right. want any help from those guys. Yeah. So, yeah. But they love the Mark boats. Yeah. Because they serve an important purpose. They do disobey the order of them. I guess not really an order, but there's like this gigantic storm. Yeah. And they tell him to avoid it. And he says we're going straight through because he wants to make his deadlines. And he does. He makes it yeah. Yeah. several minutes early. Yeah. So that's some satisfaction for our 162 boys. And they've earned it. But yeah, they don't heed the advice of the Mark boat. And <laughs> I suppose they could have been lost. And indeed, right. many airships are lost. So why don't we talk a little bit about the supplementary material? Because there's a yeah. whole bunch of it. Yeah, so this is so cool. It's basically the rest of the newspaper that this article appears in. So we get advertisements, we get shipping lane bulletins, news regarding recent accidents, including the abandoned freighter that the mailboat picks up the and yeah. helps facilitate the rescue of the crew. So they actually, I forgot to talk about that. They send this freighter into the ocean. Like they actually grapple it with some kind of grapple. Yeah. And it's like, it seems a little bit, not great. Like, it seems like, well, you're trying to not have an obstruction in air traffic, but you're, like, sending this thing to the bottom of the ocean. Whatever. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> the ray got busted somehow, and they had the crew abandoned, so it nobody yeah. was on board. No, it's just, like, it's just, like, storing your nuclear waste under, like... Well, yeah, uh, right. I don't know. It's just... Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's just... I think just to modernize, it seems a little bit, like, you know... I don't know yeah. if that's a great solution. But. Yeah, it's better than, I don't know, crashing it on land around people, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, we got some news updates in the world. So there is apparently a recent war between the Aerial Board of Control and Crete. And Crete happened to be the last repository of local self-government. But the ABC quickly took care of that. The ABC, we learned, was founded in 1949 and is the body responsible for all the planet's traffic, not just the mail. And there's also some correspondence and letters to the editor, which complain about the atmospheric bombing for the scientific purposes on behalf of the nation of Transylvania. Yeah, and it seems like the Transylvanians don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so I think actually here we're getting a hint of what would become so important in the next story where people are like really weird about their privacy and they don't want like, right. they don't want to be disturbed kind of thing. And Yeah, but there's also a, quite a bit of humor. In this section, too. There is, yeah. There's a review of a biography of a Xavier Lavalle, who is some important scientist and theologian. The advertisements are great. Because <laughs> yeah. not only do we learn a lot of stuff about the world, the airships are primarily dirigibles, and that apparently they just couldn't get airplane designs to work right. So less than 2% 
of the world's passengers are carried by airplane, and none of the planet's freight is. It's all done by dirigible. So we get an advertisement by the Standard Dig Construction Company of Millwall and Buenos Aires that says, Remember, planes are swift, so is death. Planes are cheap, so is life. Why does the plane builder insist on the safety of his machines? Methinks the gentlemen protest too much. The Standard Dig Construction Company do not build kites. They build, equip, and guarantee dirigibles. So just the way he drops in things like that about how the world functions, not in some kind of data dump, but something that is and feels natural to the world itself, I think is just such a cool technique that you really see more with the modernist writers that were yeah. A little bit later from the, the teens and the 20s. And I got to point out again, like, this is something that Robert Heinlein does a fair bit. Yeah, for sure. I don't know that he's necessarily as, like, his writing doesn't maybe sing like Kipling's, but he has this, like, way of just saying, okay, so here's a society that we're living in now. He doesn't make it seem like an exposition dump. Right. And he makes right. it seem like naturally something that would generate from the story. Yeah. And I also have to point out in the story, I think it's called The Army of the Future that Kipling wrote in, I believe it was 1905. He talks about, it's one of their, their kind of a utopia dream kind of stories, I guess, in a sense, about a character who falls asleep and dreams of the future. And he's dreaming about like military suffrage and how it would work and it's how it's universal for everyone. And, I mean, it's voluntary, but if you don't volunteer, you don't get the privilege of voting. Yeah. And right. you don't get the privilege of there's other things you can't do. Like, if you're poor, you don't get any relief from the government. And Kipling, of course, adds that also the women don't love you. <laughs> so, and this is very Heinlein. If you read Starship, Starship Troopers, Troopers, you will yeah. recognize yeah, this. Uh, say, totally. Yeah. 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 yeah I kind of, I don't know. I, I'm... Mixed on Heinlein in general. Yeah, no, me too. Like his old man sex novels are nothing I really want to read more of. But I don't know. I'm yeah. kind of curious about some of his early short stories. And I wouldn't mind rereading Moon yeah. is a Harsh Mistress sometime. I think I'd like to do some on the podcast as well. Yeah. I, yeah. I also have, like, I would never consider him necessarily a favorite. But I think he's important and interesting enough. He's definitely important. I mean, to... he was, I mean, pretty much one of the three big ones from the golden age along with Arthur yeah, C. Clarke. Yeah, one of the big Americans from that yeah. period, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, I think as we've discussed, there were other parts of the world that were doing things concurrently that yeah, maybe for should sure. be noticed more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not... Well, maybe it is our fault that we flood out the market so much, but... <laughs> Ed on the science fiction book group on Facebook was kind of saying, like, oh, things seem to be very skewed towards the Jernsback like the Jernsback thing. And, and it, right. that seems to be the case. Yeah. So I think that part of our podcast reasoning should be, although we don't want to turn aside those things and not acknowledge them, we want to make sure that we acknowledge all the other things that were happening. Yeah, absolutely. As well. And there's certainly a lot of interesting things happening. Yeah. So, yeah. And the review of the biography of Laval, that was definitely very humorous as well. And yeah. It didn't really read like a review, like it started out sort of like a review, but then it turned into like, it almost seemed like the biography itself. Oh, like right, it, yeah. It's, it's kind of a weird thing to read in a book review. Although, to be fair, I have read book reviews that are like this, and most of them are published in places like the Washington Post, mm -hmm. where it's like the, the reviewer is reviewing this work of nonfiction about a person, and the person reviewing the book might be like this old literati person himself and instead of reviewing the book he goes on this big tangent about what happened when he met that person that the book was about yeah like it's it's <laughs> but it's fun it's really fun and uh there's some good humor in there there's a funny description of a woman who's not wearing much clothing as a person <laughs> that's costumed with compromises i i <laughs> and there's, yeah, like there's a dispute between this Frenchman and the mayor of this town, I guess. And I don't know. It's fun. It's thrown in there among all the advertisements and letters to the editor and yeah. sort of snarky back remarks from the editor that seem like... Very snarky remarks. From yeah, the they're a little bit like <laughs> they want to put the readers in their place. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I think what's interesting that he does here is he doesn't really hint that it's not necessarily a technological utopia in the first part of the main story, but he definitely hints at some dark underpinnings of the ABC in this supplemental material. Yeah. And I think that's kind of an interesting tie to the main story because we primarily see a lot of working class people in the actual story itself, regular people just doing their jobs that aren't the center of the universe. It's super refreshing. Is kind of a one complaint I have. A lot of science fiction is like, your main character is the most important person in the world, and if you take him out of the course of the world's events, things would radically be different. Yeah. Whereas this, we follow mail ship number 162, and presumably there's at least 161 other ones. Right. And you, you take these characters out of the world, and the ABC still controls everything. Yeah, and I think that's, although you're right, that that is definitely... And that is something that uh, science fiction has also been criticized for, as well as this ties in with this imperialism thing. Yeah. But, like, the whole power fantasy, you know? Right, like exactly, there, there's, yeah, yeah. There's a book, I've probably mentioned it before because it's such an interesting thought exercise, even though it's not a great book, but it's called The Iron Dream by Norman Spinrod, and it's, like, this book that purports to be by Adolf Hitler, mm. and it's a, hypothesizing what would have happened if Hitler had become a science fiction writer, Instead of, you know, uh, his interest was in illustrating, and so he wrote, he did a bunch of illustrations for science fiction magazines, and then went on to writing. And so the author of this book hypothesizes, oh, what would the book be like if Hitler wrote it? And so the name of the book within the book in The Iron Dream is The Lord of the Swastika, and it talks about how this character sort of goes back to his homeland after a long period of exile and finds out that it's been overtaken by all these unwanted forces. And so he has to take it back. And not only does he have to take it back, but he has to build this unstoppable army and then build a rocket that's shaped like a phallus that <laughs> shoots up into space, spreading the seed of the, yeah, right. quote, Aryan, quote, man. Kind of funny in retrospect, considering what's been in the news lately. Right. The author of that book was kind of supposing that this was a kind of basis for a lot of science fiction of the the Golden Age type. And I, I feel like his criticism is maybe a bit unfair. I don't think it was all like that. I think, okay, maybe a little bit. Yeah. In certain cases. I, I, think, that, I think that some of the problems with, like, modern critiques is sometimes the, the brushstrokes can be a bit too broad. Like, yeah, I for just, sure. Yeah, I don't think it's entirely fair, but it is still an interesting thought exercise. Yeah, and I still think that yeah, like, I mean, to bring this back to Kipling, like we're dealing with somebody who, I guess, has often been accused of having this real solid love of empire and wanting to spread the message of empire. Right, and I mean, not without good reason too. Yeah. And so the ABC, though, seems more, they seem rather free of uh, national restrictions. Yeah. And we see more of that in the next story. But I thought it was kind of interesting. Like, I, I don't think, I, I definitely think what he's trying to say is in part the ABC is completely independent of any national jurisdiction. Right. And he says it like it's a good thing, more or less. There may be some caveats. Yeah, the, the politics are kind of weird, and some of the crit I read for primarily the second one, because the, the the next one seems to be more recognized and commented on than the first one, for whatever reason, but the commentators and critics seem to have a hard time pinning down what he was actually trying to say with yeah. the organizations that present themselves in these stories. Pretty much almost all of them conflict with one another, which I think is interesting. <laughs> Yeah. I definitely got conflicting feelings about it, too. Yeah. Do you want to just start talking about the next one, then? So before we get into that one, real quick, let's talk about some of the slang and jargon in this story. Yeah, so there's definitely both... There's two sides, I think, to the, the jargon. There's the sort of casual, nautical kind of jargon, and there's right. also, like, the technical engineering kind of jargon. Yeah. Which is generally 
not not so much spoken in dialogue, but it's definitely a unique facet of the story. And it's kind of a mix of the real world technical terms and the futuristic. Right. I mean, some things seem pretty new. I don't know if you know of any use of colloid in like engineering, but it's supposed to it's usually biology, like a biology term. Yeah, I was trying to look that up and to see what he was referring to with that, because it looked like it played some part into the comm system, but then he was speaking about it as if it were like a view hole in the ship. Yeah, I guess so. It's supposed to be like a small, like a small group of particles that's kind of like like above the molecular level but still right. invisible so yeah i mean my sort of microscopic obviously but right. like not as small as a molecule certainly not so i don't know I, I mean i guess it just yeah maybe a very small viewing hole and i think that he i think that when the, the airships are alongside one another they actually use it to communicate to yeah they assume. do yeah. It's weird. You'd think it'd be really windy or something. I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that would work. Yeah. So I can't, I couldn't really picture it, but it was cool. I mean, he's coming up with these futuristic uses for things that are in existence like that. And of course the YouTube, which somebody actually sits in. Right. Right. I think I, I imagine that most YouTubes are not man sized. Although maybe they are, but, and yeah. And then of course there's the, the spoken jargon, the things that they use for terms like skylarking. Right. Which seems to be setting off explosions and stuff in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> like just detonating bombs and stuff like that in the air just for the hell of it, I guess. Or, I mean, maybe to change the weather. I don't know. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that Italian Renaissance guy you were talking about who's like talking about how he was shooting off his artillery to try yeah, and change Yeah, Benvenuto the Cellini. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, there's the Woolly Waz. Right. Which is my favorite word. Yeah, it's so but cool. That, that is actually a 19th century nautical term. Yeah, yeah. But its origin is unknown, according to the Oxford Dictionary. Gore Vidal wrote a book in, like, in the 50s or something, and he said that the origin was Aleutian, but I don't. there doesn't seem to be any proof of that. Huh, yeah, that's interesting. So, and it definitely seems to be older than, like, Americans fighting in the Aleutians right. against Japanese. So I don't know, like that's what his book is about. But it's mm. it's definitely one of the citations in the OED is actually Kipling. Uh not this story though, it's Kim. Oh. And they talk about Woolly Waz. So that was in nineteen oh one. And there's two older citations from like the eighteen forties, but they're spelled differently. It's like W I L L I W A W or right. something like that. Right. So this spelling might be unique to Kipling, I guess. Not sure, but it's definitely a nautical term for a kind of a, like a sudden, gusty, I guess, wind that blows the ships off course. Right, and they certainly encounter their fair share of those. Yeah, and they can be quite dangerous. Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. So from now on, you can incorporate that into your everyday conversation. <laughs> right. Talk about all the woolly waz that you've been experiencing, so. But I mean, no, yeah. just a subtle use of language here really gives a story a unique color that I don't really think we've seen too much in some of the other stories we've covered on the podcast. No, not at all. And, and I mean, it's definitely some technique that we will see future authors use yeah. to try and add color and add distinction to their world building. Sure. Which, I mean, we keep coming back to that, but Kipling sure does a lot of it here. And, you yeah. know, in the bonus material, there's that all the correspondence. And we're only seeing one end, mostly, of the correspondence. So we're only seeing the sort of pithy replies uh, of the editor. <laughs> right. And it's it very much seems like something you would see nowadays on the internet. Like they're very brief and snappy yeah. and then they almost right. they almost read like Twitter posts or yeah. something like yeah. that. Yeah, no, they definitely do. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So I really liked those aspects of that that the story. Uh the terms that they use on the plane, like the, the dip dial and stuff like right. that. that, that yeah. 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 So there's a lot of cool use of language, definitely. And although I kind of thought at first that Kipling just made up the Wooly Wah. It still doesn't seem to be... It's, it's, it's still kind of obscure. So yeah. It's an yeah. interesting mix of reality and fantasy. Right. And which I think is, it which makes well. it cooler. Yeah, exactly. Because it, it seems like something from the future. So yeah. yeah. I guess so with that, we're going to take a little break. And we'll be back in a minute with Easy as ABC.
1912, Kipling wrote a sequel of sorts to With a Nightmare called As Easy as ABC. It was originally serialized in the London Magazine in two parts, one in March and one in April. Again, like With the Night Mail, there are some minor text differences in later republications, which the text on Forgotten Futures, which we will link to in the episode bibliography, comments on. Because I think commentary is, again, very good on the text and very thorough. Yeah. Certainly more thorough than some of the book republications, which is kind of a shame. Because some of them do have really cool illustrations. Yeah, all all of these were illustrated in yeah. different forms. So you right. have basically three different styles of illustration to choose yeah. from. Yeah. Some color, some black and white. Yeah, no, it's very neat stuff. And very appropriate illustrations to the story, too. So this one opens up with the transportation is civilization bit from With the Night Mail. And the narrator in this story is the official reporter of the board. And on August 26th, the board in London is informed by somebody named DeForest. And for this character, I could only picture vacuum tube inventor Lee DeForest here. I don't know if that's what Kipling had in mind or if that's just a total coincidence, but huh. um, this is who I pictured for <laughs> this character. The real life DeForest was apparently a major asshole and in addition to an engineering genius. Which I kind is, of thought of DeForest Kelly, who played Dr. McCoy on Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. you know, like, it's fun because this story is a little different. Like, this story is more plot-driven, I guess. It's way more plot-different, yeah. There, there's an actual plot in this and, and characters that have personality yeah. traits. And the characters are fun. They have a lot of personality. Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah, but... DeForest informs the board that the District of Northern Illinois has cut itself out from all the systems, leaving every freight and passenger tower out of operation. So the whole region is just totally dead in the water. And DeForest, along with Dragomirov from Russia, Takahira from Japan, and Parolo from Italy are sent to correct the issue. And the narrator joins them on the ship the Victor Parolo, named for a botanist who it turns out to be said Parolo on board, because you know, why wouldn't you travel on your own ship? <laughs> yeah. Also on board with them is Eustace Arnett, who is a ABC fleet commander, even though war appears to be a thing of the distant past. The, I guess, texts are a little inconsistent with what dates happen when, but this appears to be 65 years after the events of With the Night Mail. Yeah, I mean, maybe some of the different publications said something different in the title, but it's definitely 60. It seems yeah. like it's 65. Yeah. Just as some say it's like 2100 or 21. Ex exactly. Yeah. Something. But that but is I, never mentioned in the story. So right, yeah. it just seems like something that the magazine added, maybe, or something. I don't know. Yeah. So this crew takes a ship to investigate what happened. The Illinois district is completely shrouded in timber forest to maintain the privacy of the residents there, as privacy is of utmost importance. For the first time here, there is a statue in Chicago mentioned. The statue is unfortunately titled Salati's Statue of the N-Word in Flames, which is a bit jarring for the modern reader. Yeah, it seems like most of the time when it's said, it's the Japanese guy that says it. Right. That and weird? The, I don't know. <laughs> the statue is supposed to be horrible, like so horrible that it's only unveiled once a year during Thanksgiving. We're not really told what it depicts. William Stoddard, in his essay, Every Crowd is Crazy, state that it depicts a lynching victim, but I don't know if that's ever explicitly spelled out in the story. I think it is kind of spelled out. I... I... I don't know. It's not really gone into, but yeah, it's it seems like... It's certainly some race-based violence. Yeah, yeah. Whatever form that takes. And apparently it's horrible in the sense that it's like a Goya painting or whatever, where the artist is extremely effective at conveying human suffering and just yeah. a, a terrible uh, scene and 
different situation. So the statue comes up a couple times in the story, but now our crew is flying over Illinois. We also learn the world population is somewhere between 500 and 600 million people. Over Lake Michigan, villages are totally dark and they are forced to use an illuminated map to get around. The ship lands near this veranda, but they get stuck in the ground after a few paces in some sort of electrical trap. And this woman that lives there comes out and apologizes to them and turns the system off, allowing them to move again. But It's a security system that basically paralyzes the victims with like an electrical force field. Yeah, like holds them in place, kind like? of. Yeah. Yeah. It was a cool piece of tech, for sure. They called it the ground circuit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Upon seeing Arnett's board uniform, she promptly turns it back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're like, mercy, mercy. Yeah. Uh, they say they're trying to investigate the outages, and she tells them just to go to Chicago, and there's nothing that they can do here. And the crew loses patience with this, and they yell out, the nature of the circuit and how it's constructed. And this leads the people on board the ship to break it. And they're able to get free, much to the woman's dismay. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Right afterwards, they hear this massive plow coming around. And it's this giant cultivator with these huge spinning blades that are coming right towards them and attempting to ram them. So they quickly get on board their ship and lift off. And they debate what to do with the woman, but ultimately decide to just drop it and go to Chicago. So this segment, I think, more than any of the other parts of the story, is really what influences the libertarian Highland stuff of the, yeah. I don't want any government in my backyard, <laughs> individualist, like I'm going to live for myself in some shack in the woods and be totally self-sufficient. Yeah. Yeah, uh, th this scene really highlights that that line of thinking. So they are going to Chicago, and they are coming into the city. They are able to observe City Hall and the Old Market. And they hear people below singing the Forbidden Song, Pat McDonough's song, which came out of the plague. I love McDonough's song. Yeah. It's so good. It's so weird, though. Like, I wanted, I would have read that on the air, but I'm like, I don't know, man. It doesn't seem right, and it's not being sung, so I'm not going to... Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it it's pretty like wild. It's, it's pretty wild and pretty extreme, but it's it makes you feel something, which I guess is what Kipling was good at sometimes. So, yeah. He, he's very good at it here, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a screed against the unfortunate power of the crowds. And it is almost an exhortation. I mean, it is an exhortation to holy war. And at the end of the story, the entire poem is given. But throughout the tale, we only get the last verse. It's constantly referenced throughout the story. But one of the weird things that, well, I guess weird, odd things about this universe is the anti-democracy notions. Yeah. That groups of people will just lead to mob rule and chaos and lead to things like racial violence and plagues and things like that. There's actually a really good, I mean, I have to say, like, it's actually a very, it seems satirical, like it seems like humor was part of the aim, but there's actually a really good explanation where he just really turns democracy on its head and is like exposing every shitty thing about it and being like, ha, huh, you see? Yeah. And, you know, like, it's funny, but it's like, well, not, not exactly wrong. <laughs> yeah. He does it really well, actually. So this song is forbidden, and people are singing it. And it seems to the crew that the people have reverted back to the old days of chaos and democracy. Well, yeah, because even though, like, they don't, like, obviously they modern civilized people approve of the way things are now they don't approve of the song because the song is bloody minded right the song is a relic of people who are violent to one another because the fact that they were in these groups that didn't they didn't want to be that way they had no reason to be that way made them violent i guess yeah 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 definitely yeah so it appears to be that the crowd below might also turn violent at some point soon 
and they are really worried that they might actually kill somebody. Arnett says they have their fleet in position, and Dragomirov begs for mercy. And he's really portrayed as being the sympathetic character who doesn't want to use force yeah. at any step along the way, in pretty much stark contrast to the Griffith, who portrays the Russians as the symbol of despotism and tyranny. Right. Kipling can't help but inject a little humor there, too, because he's like, at one point, he says, oh, in Russia, we never we never used to treat people yeah, that right. way. <laughs> and I think it's the Italian guy is like, that's not true. Yeah. You know, like, why can't you speak facts? <laughs> but yeah. But ultimately, his pleas for mercy are ignored. And the ships fire their beams down, which are these concentrated pillars of light. And this is just totally horrifies Dragomirov. And he's about to faint because I guess he assumes that these crowds of people have just been massacred. But he's told that they're just the siege lights who temporarily blind the people that they're struck with, as well as the ship emitting some kind of sonic weapon that temporarily deafens them. Yeah. Aim to basically disable and disperse large crowds. Here they say roughly 250 people. It's an unprecedented crowd. Yeah. 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 So they plead for their release, and they're given that, and... Dragomirov is still horrified at this and says that in Russia they reason with people and don't yeah. use <laughs> this kind of force at first. But he's jeered at for that. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the ship touches down. They land at the North Landing Tower in Chicago, which is now deserted. And as they exit, they hear the horrific groans of people below. And... Perlo here tells them that they'll be fine tomorrow and that the effects are just temporary and it's just light and sound, nothing more. Yeah. So DeForest requests that he talk with somebody and the mayor comes forward. And the mayor, the chief of police, and two others are talking with the board delegation and DeForest wants to know why they cut out of the grid. And the mayor says the problem is they have too much damn democracy. And that a number of these serviles, people who can't live without listening to themselves. Yeah, so there's a new class of people called the serviles. I thought it was an interesting name for them, too, the, the serviles. Like, I guess they're serving, what, like, human... I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah, I didn't really get the sense of what they do. Mulligan, the health officer, says, again, transportation is civilization, democracy is diseased. I proved it by the blood test every time. The serviles have been getting to talking, telling people how to manage their own affairs, which is in itself an invasion of privacy, but would prefer that to making crowds. And crowds these days are as rare as murder. However, men have been starting to gather in the market in the thousands and even started to touch one another. They are talking about how badly things were managed in the city. The serviles had to be grounded to prevent them from getting killed. The Serviles wanted popular government, voting, debate, and all that old-fashioned nonsense. So the mayor cut out from the grid when people started to get the idea that people start to think that their privacy is being invaded. Any yeah. other reason and self-preservation goes. I mean, it does sound a little bit familiar. Yeah, right. <laughs> a little bit. I mean... The concerns are maybe justified, but it's not in the way that Kipling supposed, perhaps. But, yeah, uh, and I think he's also yeah. kind of in panic mode here, too. Yeah. But uh, traffic lights have been cut, landing towers have been locked, and the mayor called the board to ask them to step in and wants them to take control of the situation. So as day approaches, they hear a roar of angry voices who want to kill the serviles and say they'll never go back to the old ways. Sun's starting to come up and illuminating this crowd of almost 3,000 people and says these people mean business. And fortunately, they've been provisioned for six months. A man amongst the people starts to talk, says they're under the heel of the ABC and urges the crowd to break down the doors and talks about a new world created through the sanctity of the crowd and the villainy of the single person. The crowd wants the prisoners gone and 
DeForest politely asks the prisoners to come, but they don't want to go. They just want to make crowds. Yeah. And yell. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Perillo says that they should come or the crowd will kill them. And the orator laughs and says that would be murder. I, just, I guess something just so out of the question in this world that it's such a ridiculous notion. A woman comes forward and says she has three children and doesn't want her children to fall into the crowds. She says that crowds make trouble. They bring back the old days. Hate, fear, blackmail, publicity. The people. That. 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 And she's pointing to the statue, which makes the crowd growl and intensely uncomfortable. And she says she doesn't want them killed, but an example should be made, and urges them to look at the statue unveiled. But DeForest says that nobody wants to look at it on an empty stomach. And the woman says, perhaps this will help you decide, and she throws out her arm, which has a knife in her hand, presumably to stab herself. She stopped by the current, which falls flashing at the feet of the statue. DeForest says that they can't waste a life like hers on these people and will take them away if they don't do anything stupid. Yeah, so one of them acted really fast and switched on some kind of electric thing. Yeah, right right at the last second yeah. when she was about to stab herself. It just kind of froze her in place. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was whole that whole thing was uncomfortable. And the scene was uncomfortable. And her trying to kill herself, like, it, it makes you think, like, yeah. how alien... How alien is this life that these people are leading? Yeah, it's a really weird society. Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think that that's something that also we come to terms with in a lot more modern science fiction works. And it does make us feel uncomfortable sometimes because the customs that are expressed by, by people in certain cultures that just seem like normal, everyday things. Like, why wouldn't this woman want to kill herself? Yeah, but right. We're right. like... That seems horrible. Like, that's yeah. so extreme. Why would she do that? Yeah. Like, it just seems so wasteful and pointless. Right. And again, with the last story, we don't get any data dumps of why the world is this way, really. We get no, hints and really, flashes no. here and there, but we don't get any segments where Kipling is directly talking to us saying, and 30 years ago, X happened, and then Y <laughs> happened, and then... Don't you know that... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Arnold? Uh... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So DeForest tells the woman that he'll take the serviles with them. And the mayor says they will destroy the old market. And DeForest says, blow up the statue too. And the mayor agrees. So the statue is shot with these high power beams and melted. And the narrator sees an inscription on it that states, To the eternal memory of the justice of the people. Okay. DeForest is pretty quick to get out of here and bids everybody goodbye. And when he gets back on board, he says that women are the devil. And he recognized that she would have killed herself and signaled for the flying loop to be shot at her to prevent her from doing so. So right in the nick of time. But apparently it was a little too much for her hand and her fingers got scorched a bit. Arnett is still having the fleet on retainer until the serviles are shipped out. And they're musing a bit on where to drop their passengers off. And eventually they decide on London as you could turn Satan himself loose there, and they'd only ask him to dinner. Yeah. They open up a line to London on the general communicator, and they reach a man named Leopold Vincent, who is the purveyor of London's choicest amusements, and DeForest presses Vincent to take them, pitching it as this, like, historical novelty act, and Vincent seems particularly concerned that they're <laughs> able to perform the voting trick. <laughs> and he lets a couple of them speak to Vincent to prove that it's actually a genuine thing and he's not just pulling his leg. And the serviles yeah. complain about some of the conditions they're in. But and Vincent's... the woman the woman just goes nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I listened to the audiobook recently and the way he did that was just really funny. I can't remember the name of the narrator now, but there is an audiobook version of with the nightmare slash as easy as ABC and Although uh, he did a decent job of the first story, I really seemed to get into the second one a lot. So, and yeah, like the way he did this speech of complaint was just hysterical. Uh, I, yeah, I I'm going to have to listen to that because I, I didn't get a chance <laughs> to listen to that yet. But yeah, for, I don't know, I, I guess I can see why people give more attention to the second one than the first one. But I, I think I like them both equally for different reasons. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're both really, really great. So this bit at the end is it's really funny. Vincent. 
the purveyor is is more concerned if they can perform their act rather than any well-being for the, the people themselves involved. And he's overjoyed when he realizes that he's finally getting his shot in the public eye. And the narrator and all the board members are amazed at how can all these serviles be so negative in their perceptions of life. And as they're coming into London, they start to shamelessly weep. And that's how the story ends. But there's also this this really sad moment at the end when he's like looking at all these lights beneath and like starts to cry. Yeah. Yeah, like I don't know. I I really enjoyed this, but I feel like maybe some of the emotional connection was beyond me and I don't know if it was because of the society that Kipling was was envisioning and how different it was. But yeah. I mean, there were definitely some very strange elements to this that were like uncomfortable but in a cool way. Yeah. Yeah, he packs a lot in here. Yeah, this is yeah. longer than the first one, I think even including the supplementary bonus stuff. And at the end, he he, again, he does show the entirety of McDonough's song. And yeah, he does. Yeah. I would suggest anybody interested, just read that. It is a really heavy poem, and it is actually quite stirring, but like not the engineer's poem I read earlier, which is kind of like you can sort of relate it in a very general way to a lot of things, and it, it feels like the kind of semi-inspirational, semi-wise words of, of a scholar. But this is like right. really, it's really bloody. It's really intense. It's counter to a lot of things that we're sort of encouraged to believe in, I think, from a young age. I don't necessarily think that Kipling believed in what he was saying when he wrote this poem. I think that being somebody who did support the political status quo to an extent, he probably, yeah. he would have been like, well, the face of our institutions are parliamentarian and democratic so right yeah like, like i said earlier the crit was really divided on what kipling was actually trying to say with the different societies here i mean you have the imperial almost overreach of the abc you have the libertarian woman on her farm you have this weird servile uprising movement and the whole society of crowds being foreign to i guess anywhere yeah in in the world if you know, london and america are both having these these issues and this final act i guess if you want to call it that of people being sold as museum pieces which comes up in a fair amount of science fiction afterwards yeah and these are human beings there's yeah. human being like yeah that's weird that's weird by any stretch of the imagination yeah i, I don't know so. if there's any good precursors for that as you know, humans being exhibited as museum objects or tourist attractions. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, I guess even a little bit like Culver's Travels, that's, that's kind of a thing. But yeah, yeah, I guess I that's true. Know. Yeah, like in this story, it's a little bit upsetting. Like that's, I don't know, the whole thing with the serviles is very strange. And it's so, yeah, like, again, I can picture Robert Heinlein and... Cool. Anderson also spoke about Kipling and Anderson. I'm not going to say that he was exactly the same as Heinlein in his politics because I don't really know, but he was definitely one of those people because, I mean, I read an introduction in one of his books where he was basically saying that there were a lot of people, unwise, ignorant people who were saying things like, well, we shouldn't be spending all this resource and money and everything else on space travel and on research in space when we have so many problems at home. And he was like belittling that entire philosophy and mindset. Right. And just talking about how stupid it was. Right. And I mean, I don't know, personally, I don't think he's entirely wrong, but like just the way that it was phrased was very belligerent and sort of like, yeah, this, your problems are not that significant. Sure. Like yeah. It, it did right. seem a little bit condescending, and I really right. like him. I really like him as a writer, and I like yeah. his a lot of his, the stuff that he wrote, and I admire the fact that he was somebody who wrote multi-genre and sort of didn't necessarily stick to one thing all the time, and and so I think he deserves admiration. And the fact that somebody like Kipling and his obvious appreciation of work and progress and things like that. It makes a lot of sense. And here, I think an interesting thing about this story is I don't know that 
it, it seems like the depiction of the serviles, like you're supposed to feel a little bit sorry for them. Yeah. Like it's yeah. not, oh, look at these freaks. What do they deserve? They deserve to be put in a museum. Like it's actually pitiful. Yeah. I mean, in, in a sense, they're really the only connection that the contemporary reader would have with this world. You know, yeah. People in their old ways of democracy and voting. Right. And they're also depicting us having like various health defects. Yeah, right. Probably because they stick together in crowds and they like crowds. Right. Tuberculosis. And it's an interesting story to be reading now because crowds are, are not really supposed to be a thing right now in this right. part of the world. Right. Yeah. And uh, they certainly reference a plague within recent memory. Yeah. They talk about tuberculosis, actually. Yeah. So I don't know if it's a variation of that super virulent tubules and like, I don't know. I don't know exactly. They don't really go. He doesn't go into it, but it's definitely suggested that it's a thing in there. Yeah. So many of the serviles have lung conditions. They're sick. Yeah. I mean, certainly as we've seen, plagues have influenced literature and how people view society for millennia. Yeah. And I, I really enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed There were a little bit of national stereotypes, which we'll oh, yeah, see more yeah. of. A story that I want to do is The Martian Odyssey by Stanley Weinbaum, and it depicts an expedition to Mars with a Frenchman and an Englishman and various other nationalities. Right. And you saw that in some of the 60s Doctor Who stories as well, you know, where they're trying to show, like, sort of a United Nations space force and all that, like, especially the, the, the Patrick Troughton ones that were set in the future, and it's kind of... Obviously, a lot of British actors doing silly accents most of the time, but I mean, it's cool. Yeah, you know, I get it. Yeah. And, and some of them are having fun. I think that's more important than anything else. But that's yeah. just me. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's just, I enjoyed that aspect of it. I thought that it was, I mean, it was not handled too badly. It was done with good humored intentions. The Japanese character, his insistence on using the racial slur was kind of funny. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I don't. It was weird, but I guess anybody else would have done it. It just seemed like it was commonly him who was saying, "Oh, isn't that the N-word statue?" Mm. Uh, I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Kipling traveled a lot, and and it seemed like he was really into portraying. Like he wanted his English readership to know about all these. You know, something like Kim, I think that definitely got some criticism, especially from the Indian like contemporary uh, nowadays Indian readership, which right. yeah, makes yeah. sense. I mean, yeah, no, for sure. I think there can be a lot of resentment, right? So it's, it's not unfounded. But yeah, an interesting person with interesting things to say. I really enjoyed both these. Like I actually reading them, especially, well, I mean, both of them, but especially I think as easy as ABC had a little more emotional content to it. And he really tapped into some things and i really found myself swept away by certain things about it and the way it was written yeah definitely it's kind of shitty but it's like it makes perfect sense that kipling was asked to write propaganda well you want somebody with talent writing for you you know yeah like he's really good at pulling on these emotional centers and really getting you to feel things by his writing that's a good thing that's not like, when it's used in the surface of propaganda, it's art being used in the surface of propaganda. So it's like, right. if you have that ability, that's an amazing thing. And and Kipling just had it. And even if you read The Jungle Book, like, kids read that. But it's just so, I don't know, like, he just inhabits things so well. And you cannot dismiss him. Like, his his short stories, there's just so many of them. And they're just so, like observant and so i'm everywhere right and none of this really reads like pro-imperialist stuff no. it, it almost feels like a not necessarily a satire on imperialism but certainly a critique of it and this is often described as a dystopia and i think in many ways it, it is that i would certainly miss shows i've been missing concerts yeah. i actually went to a concert last week it was my first concert since the end of 2019 Oh, really? Yep. That's cool. So it was a jazz quartet. Yeah. They were nice. really good. You know, pretty fiery. Yeah. It's kind of the music I grew up with. I don't actually know the name of the band, which is kind of funny. But <laughs> I just got <laughs> a good time. Yeah. A random ticket. Kind of somebody, a friend of mine had an extra ticket, and then we went to this jazz show. And no, that's great. Yeah. yeah. It's good. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's hard to fathom. Like, I never, 
I don't know. I don't know. This this whole idea of democracy being like the crowd. I mean, I understand that crowds can be manipulated, like and and often often in satire and stuff, it's depicted as being really easy to manipulate crowds. Right. And there's been books like nonfiction books written about how to manipulate crowds. Sure, yeah, of course. So I mean it's an interesting area of the genre that we in chrononauts have never even begun to touch on before and there's this really sociological aspect i wonder wells was around i wonder if he ever read these stories and what he would have thought about them like what would he say i don't know i mean kipling was very popular during his lifetime as was wells yeah i don't know how much wells read other contemporary authors or how much kipling did but it's certainly not outside the realm of plausibility that they would have been aware of one another and read each other's stuff i mean there were certainly a lot of connections between all these british writers and you can map them out like it's there they had the same publishers they had the same they knew the same people right and all that but it does seem like at a certain point the british literary movement sort of left kipling behind a little bit he was kind of seen as being too established maybe i don't know man there's just something there's something about the way that he writes I would say there are only a few writers in the Chrononauts experience thus far that have been able to capture something even remotely similar. I would say Wells, I mean, obviously he has his own voice. Right. Like, that's the whole point, is that a lot of these writers have their own voices. Wells, for sure. Shelley, maybe Lindsay in A Voyage to Arcturus. I don't know. I mean, it's up for debate, obviously, but... It's just like when you read somebody like like Villiers, for example, uh, writer of uh, right. the future uh, Eve. Yes, I don't know, like his unfortunate tendencies. Like there seems to be some misogynism there and stuff. Oh yeah, like it's harder to like, not necessarily ignore, but it's harder to like because the book isn't that extraordinarily well written. It just seems more like the faults are they stand out a little bit more. Right, exactly. And it prevents something like that book from, like, Future Eve from becoming, like, one of the best books we've read on the podcast, even though there's cool stuff in it that's yeah, absolutely. really powerful towards the end, especially. And, I mean, with this, the faults don't really seem to be with the work or any nasty undercurrents in the work itself, but more the author's personal life and, and feelings yeah, and what yeah. he wrote elsewhere. These stories, I think, are fantastic and definitely near the top of the stuff that we read and i don't really see any flaws in them that are really apparent i mean as far as no i mean i think as easy as abc is a little hard to understand like yeah but i also feel that he did that on purpose kind of right absolutely yeah i mean it just throws you right into the world and it's such a strange unique cool world that I don't know. I, I found that one just fantastic to read. Yeah, me too. I mean, I just like, I had this smile on my face, I think, like most of the time when I was reading it. Like, it was yeah. just, I can't help but enjoy the way he writes characters. I can't help but enjoy the way he has people speak to each other. And the thing is, like, we just finished reading The Angel of the Revolution. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> like, Okay, great. Socialist revolution. Sounds awesome, right? But nobody talks to each other properly. Everybody's boring. Like, yeah. I don't know, yeah, man. This was the exact opposite of Angel yeah. Revolution. Yeah. In every single way. Definitely, definitely highly recommended this one. Like we said, we'll link the Forgotten Futures link. I think that's probably the best and most complete edition with the text because it has extensive notes on textual differences on publication history as well as all the versions of the illustrations yeah i would say i would i would highly highly suggest that fans of the genre read these stories i mean we talk about a lot of things on this podcast we've done what like 15 16 episodes now this is number 17 yeah okay we're on episode 17 so we've talked about a lot of stories we've like not recommended some we've recommended others but i think if you really want to feel the essence of where modern science fiction began, you have to read stories like this. Yeah. And it just amazes me that it's fairly unsung, like, until now, you know, until digging into this. 
podcast material. Obviously, I knew about Rudyard Kipling, but... He's not known as a sci-fi writer. No, and I didn't know about these stories. Yeah. These stories are like, this is modern sci-fi. This yeah, is... Yeah, absolutely. Right. Like, it just feels so way ahead of its time. Completely awesome in the sense of how it portrays the new culture. Not just a different culture, but the new culture that comes from the engineers and the builders that Kipling admired so much. Yeah. That uh, that admiration expressed so well in that poem, The Hymn of the Breaking Strain. And there comes with it a burden, too. Like, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, this was a theme with him. Responsibility. That meant something to him. Whether you agree with that or not, whether you think it's sometimes unfounded, like, obviously, the white man's burden is a not worthy responsibility that shouldn't exist. But, like, this is a serious thing for Kipling. This is something that he really believes in. You see it in these stories as well. But you also see that thing that you would see in a lot of future sci-fi stories where the new culture is something admirable and something so glorious because they are above all the normal everyday things like governments and kings and you know things that real humanity real men who stand up for themselves shouldn't have to worry about and shouldn't have to be a part of <laughs> and that's like that's the the thing that was supposed to stir the young people of the early 20th century when they read science fiction stories right yeah no i mean this is also interesting because in addition to depicting a new culture he doesn't belabor this point but he comments on the kind of feedback between culture and technology yeah and how one directly influences the other and right. vice versa and that's something that no author of like even a few decades before could have even conceived of Right. I mean, a lot of the stories we've seen so far have been like social commentaries and things like that, yeah. which don't really have a I guess, practical ground in how technology would perhaps actually affect a society. Whereas Kipling really seems to have mapped that out with the board controlling many areas of day to day life just due to the fact that they're able to get people and things up into the air that nobody else can yeah yeah and he makes them seem like another group of human yeah and that's something that you see in a lot of later science fiction and it even reaches uh, levels of potential discomfort now with all these transhuman type stories mm -hmm. yeah, where sure. we're talking about about beings that maybe were once human but transcend the human race and so it makes people uncomfortable to read that sometimes like they they kind of feel like is the author saying that humans are obsolete like i don't know if i like that i'm a human yeah. i don't want to be obsolete <laughs> right, right? <laughs> yeah. so and i think that kipling has already sort of gotten to the heart of that in 1905 yeah yeah extremely ahead of its time and extremely well written we can't recommend this one enough right i think it's it's written they're written so well that you should read them you should just read them if anything yes we we support the fact that some of these stories are just interesting but you should read the well-written ones yeah because they're the ones that will stick with you most they're the ones that will tickle the way you think and maybe influence you in a certain way hopefully not influence in a bad way but you know what i mean like they will influence the way you think about things, the way you think about stories. And science fiction is often a genre that's, especially in the early days, lambasted for not having the best storytellers, even though some of the concepts yeah. are really cool. And we sort of saw that with Griffith, admittedly. Yeah, we definitely saw that with him. Yeah. <laughs> and he's not the first. No, or and he probably won't, he be, won't the last, be the last. But, yeah. but every so often you see somebody like Kipling who... Is a real writer, and he can really get to the core of things in a way that some of these other people might not be able to, or they might be restricted from doing so because of what they fell into, having to publish stories in the way that they did. Right. I mean, I'm not saying that Griffith is some genius waiting in the wings to come out, but <laughs> at the same time, you gotta wonder. You gotta wonder. Sure. Sometimes. 
But it is what it is, and we really enjoyed the Kipling, and we thought the Griffith was pretty interesting. Yeah, that one's more of a bit of a yellow flag. Uh, approach with caution, I guess. Yeah. So we hope that you enjoyed this foray into the air. I know we did. I thought that both these episodes were among our most interesting episodes, and I especially yeah. liked... There was just so much to unpack in the Kipling. Like, that was a real revelation. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, they are short stories. I think they're... Yeah. Both under maybe 20,000 words total, but he packs so much in there. Yeah, he really does. So read those. War of the Air was really great by yeah. Wells. War of the War sure. Air was very great. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to travel beneath the sea next because we're still not done exploring our themes. And we are definitely keen to show what happens beneath the ocean. And that is why we'll be covering 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. And then we'll be covering... We'll also be covering The Undersea Warship, a fantastic tale of island adventure by Shunro Oshikawa from 1900. Uh, this will be the first Japanese novel we've covered on the podcast. And unfortunately, Japanese science fiction from the era, there seems to be a fair amount of it, but very few has been translated into English. So this is one of the few that have, so we're going to be... It seems like a rather famous work, perhaps. Yeah, especially in Japan. There's yeah. been a movie made out of it in the 60s, and then they made an anime out of it in the 90s. That'll be fun to dig into, I think. So the, the 60s movie is by Toho, I believe. Yeah, it looks like it was originally produced and distributed by Toho from 1963. Well, we'll be checking that out. I'll definitely watch that. I'm definitely looking forward to the 1950s... 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as well. I yeah. remember really liking that movie. It's one of Disney's few live-action movies from the time period. And, yeah, I mean, we can say a lot of things about Disney now. Uh, no interest, <laughs> no anything really from me. Yeah. But that movie is cool, and The Black Hole is cool, and a few other movies they did are pretty interesting. So, I don't know. It's going to be cool. We're going to return a little bit, I guess, to naval warfare and stuff, but hey, yeah. it should be good. I remember the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as something I read when quite young and enjoying, so it'll yep. be interesting to return to it. Yep, and we're also going to be returning to Arthur Conan Doyle in his Maricot Deep from 1929. So a later period novel, or novella, maybe. It sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that one as well. Just a late period Conan Doyle. Yeah. So that's what we have for next time. Yeah, so we encourage you to read those stories in the next month if you have time. Or if not, just read them and listen to the episode when you feel like it, which yeah. is how I usually listen to podcasts. <laughs> but we've certainly had a great time doing this. Yeah, I, absolutely. I really I felt different doing this one. I don't know why. I, I think maybe it was Kipling. I'm not sure, but it just... There was a different feeling this episode. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it was good. It was it was a good thing, for sure. No, it definitely was, yeah. Yeah, these were a lot of fun. In the meantime, we hope that you all have a good month, and we will talk to you again very soon. In the meantime, remember to keep your flurry ray engaged. Don't let any alien particles into the vacuum chamber. And remember that the slave of a ray must be well treated, for he is the one that controls your fate. We are Chrononauts, Nate and JM. We will see you again in a few weeks' time. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.